Hi everyone. Oh, loud. Sorry. Hi everyone. Um, if you're still coming in, please feel free to find a seat. Um, my name is Ben Regis. I'm the community organizer at the Waterfront Alliance. Welcome to um, our third and final panel session of the day. Um, this panel here is environmental gentrification, green infrastructure in environmental justice communities. Um, if you are here uh, and did not anticipate that being the panel, feel free to leave. There's no shame. Um, but this is the right panel. Or this is the right room for you if you're looking for that panel. Um, like I said, this is the last uh, session of the day before our closing plenary in the main hall. So right after this panel ends, there'll be just a very quick 10 minute break and then we'll do our final um, programming in the main hall downstairs. Um, last but not least, um, this panel is sponsored by Stantec um, and we have a Stantec rep uh, ready to give a, give a little speech. So on to you. Thank you, there is no speech. <laughs> Hey everyone, my name is Vijesh. I'm the uh, Tri-State BCPL for Stantec. Uh, it's just an acronym for BD and Development. Um, so uh, happy to be here. Um, you know, a little bit of introduction on the topic, um, gentrification and GI, two distinct topics which requires a lot of research and study by itself, yet has a lot of interdependency on each other, has a lot of, uh, um, you know, bearings on each other. Um, public infrastructure projects like GI, uh, if you do it carefully, correctly, it'll have a lot of beneficial to the society, but quite a few times, it could be detrimental, including gentrification, if it is not planned properly or executed properly. So it's high time for us to sort of take all the factors in, factor in while we do this kind of uh, projects. I don't know how many of you guys know Stantec. Stantec is a world leader in um, resiliency, uh, public infrastructure projects. This is one of the main factors that we take care of when we advise our uh, communities, advise our clients when we do this kind of projects. Um, very happy to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this important dialogue. Thank you so much. We are very proud to be a part of this conference. We are very proud to uh, sponsor this uh, particular panel. We look forward to work with all of you guys, all of the stakeholders, in making positive, real impact to the society. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Melissa Checker, and I'm a professor of urban studies at Queens College and of anthropology at the CUNY Graduate Center. And I am going to be your moderator and also a presenter today. So I'm very pleased to be here and thanks everyone for coming. I apologize for the view. I know it's really awful to look out these windows. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to introduce the panelists quickly and then we'll get started. Um, First, all the way on the left, we have Michael Brady, who serves as founder and partner at Canon Strategy Group, a firm committed to finding compromise and solutions when solutions and strategy are not readily apparent. Until recently, Brady was the CEO of Third Avenue Business Improvement District, the oldest and largest business district in the Bronx. During his tenure with the um, bid, Michael also led the Bruckner Boulevard Commercial Corridor and Southern Boulevard Business Improvement District. Prior to helming the district, Michael served as master planner for the South Bronx waterfront and was instrumental in leading planning efforts for the Sheridan Expressway, South Bronx Greenway, and Harlem River access plans. Michael has led four Brownfield Opportunity Planning Studies for New York State and served as an on-call real estate advisor for the New York City Mayor's Office of Environmental Remediation. Uh, skipping over here to um, my immediate left is Bernadette Callahan, a senior water resources engineer with 19 years of experience in land development and green stormwater infrastructure design. Throughout her career as Stantex green stormwater infrastructure leader, Bernadette has worked on a diverse range of projects spanning the nation, each with their own set of challenges and opportunities. Bernadette's expertise lies in crafting stormwater solutions that not only meet project objectives, but prioritize sustainability and community well-being. And um, in the middle is Yadiel Rivera Diaz, a landscape. Okay. 
landscape architect with 16 plus years of expertise in landscape architecture uh, and urban design. He joined Marvel in two, 2017 to lead its landscape architecture practice. Um, and uh, Jadiel firmly believes that good design should be accessible to everyone and community input and participation are essential for su successful designs. Currently, he leads the design of Bronx Point, a WEDG park in North, in a verified waterfront promenade, the design of the 107th Street Pier in the East River, and Norris Square Park in North Philadelphia. So um, the way that we are going to structure this panel is that we have already, uh, we met um, several weeks ago and agreed upon a set of questions and sort of who would take the lead on answering them, uh, but we're all gonna chime in on most of them and then we'll open it up for questions. So um, I'm going to start by both asking and answering the first question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should do voices, but I'm not going to. <laughs> okay, um, so the first question we start off with is, um, what is environmental gentrification? And um, from my perspective, um, I define it in as sort of three different types of, um, well, I define it as the bringing together of environmental improvements and high-end redevelopment. And uh, it takes three forms. I've, I've sort of categorized three forms that environmental gentrification takes. The first is the one that we're probably all most familiar with, which is green gentrification. And that's, um, you know, green space, waterfront promenades, um, other kinds of green infrastructure and amenities that are installed alongside of redevelopment plans, which tend to raise the property values and rents in the neighborhood, um, thereby making it unaffordable for long-term residents. So usually these green projects um, are put in place into a neighborhood that is underdeveloped, and then they help, they assist in the transformation of that area. The other kind is uh, brown gentrification, or the redevelopment uh, and repurposing of toxic sites, polluted sites. This is usually um, through brownfield programs. And that is, again, where you take a polluted site that's been you know, um, a, a problem in the community for many years. It's also been hindering redevelopment and uh, clean it up and then repurpose it for some other use and it tends to also be associated with a ra raising of property values and rents. Um, and we can discuss more about that if you want in the questions and answers. And the other um, form that I identify is called, I call it industrial gentrification, which is the um, taking old industrial um, buildings and former manufacturing sites and transforming them into green tech or clean tech um, facilities or maybe maker spaces, artisan spaces that are much more, much better for the environment, but that also can sometimes be an amenity that facilitates gentrification. And one thing I want to say before I turn it over to my fellow panelists is that I'm not trying to say that any of these things cause gentrification. I'm just saying that they play a role in it and that they are usually part of a much larger constellation of redevelopment initiatives that um, when they all come together, end up causing gentrification and often displacement. Anybody else? Want to? I could take the next. Can you hear me okay? Um, as an engineer, I really get involved with projects that are related to climate and more of that green or brown category. Uh, my experience really has been that a lot of these projects, you, you start to look at them and you, you step back and say, okay, where did we mess up and um, how are we gonna correct that? And as you start overlaying these maps and looking at the communities, you start to see the trends that unfortunately um, disadvantaged and vulnerable populations tend to live in these areas that have the highest probability of flooding, the least amount of trees, the greatest health impacts. And sadly, um, there's a huge correlation between those two. So these projects tend, a lot of the funding is now geared toward uh, correcting those past mistakes and 
um, looking at ways to target these communities. Um, but of course, we really need to think about um, how are we gonna do this in a coordinated, smart way so that these residents are getting the best value and um, also not being displaced by the improvements. Yeah, I, I, I think that I, you know, uh, when I was thinking about um, environmental gentrification, I mean, I don't necessarily love the term, but, um, and I will explain why, but uh, I mean, it's about gentrification. I think the, the bad connotation about gentrification is, is, is about displacement, right? Like, as, and this investment is like, it's like people that have uh, lived and, and cultivated a neighborhood for a while or, um, or lived and created their family, their culture, their, their, their history for a while, and, and all of a sudden investment in the neighborhood instead of um, translating into a benefit, direct benefit for them that, that they have been wanting to or, 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 or fight for, um, it, it, it translates into, into the need to actually have to disp be displaced and, and move to a, to, to a different place so that they can afford it, right? So um, at the end of the day, I don't think that many of this, those neighbors wouldn't want um, to, you know, their to own property in these places, to have their property values maybe increase, right? Like we all do. It's just that they don't get to participate in that or benefit from that at the end. So, so a lot of this needs to be about how do we, you know, it, it's multi-layer, like policies that that you know governments put in place, uh, inclusion in the design process of these communities, and input that is not just like collecting data, but actually like bringing them along into the process so that the end result actually is something that they can uh, enjoy and grow with, right, and benefit from. Right? First, um, thank you to everybody for being here. This yeah. is a great crowd, yeah. right? We, we were talking people. earlier that like the scariest thing for panelists is showing up to a room that has like two people in it. So this is awesome. <laughs> um, you know, gentrification is the latest buzzword about for the past decade or so. Prior to it, we called it community reinvestment, community revitalization. A lot of the federal programs that are funding it have those uh, nomenclatures now. But when we talk about environmental gentrification, we really have to break apart the reinvestment in infrastructure and the subsequent consequences that happen with that. And oftentimes in our city, that's triggered because, quite frankly, our municipalities, our governments can't afford it, the private sector can, and the person who carries the checkbook is the person who makes the decisions. Um, I think environmental gentrification goes a, a level deeper and it correlates directly to displacement. Gentrification is more than just planting a tree or putting in new sewer systems. It correlates to displacement not only of people, but also of resources. As things become more expensive, cultural institutions are displaced. Greenland is all of a sudden not for the people who live there. So I think when we talk about environmental gentrification, we have to create a clear division between investments in resiliency to protect our future because we are in a climate crisis, but be, have a little bit more forethought to slow down gentrification. It's, it is a, I hate to use the word inevitability, but it is something that will happen as we invest more in our cities, in our towns, throughout the country. Things will get more expensive because they are more desirable. How do we manage it is the real question. Thank you. So this leads um, to the next question, which is more, you know, most of our, the rest of our questions are more about identifying solutions and possibilities. Um, so one thing that, that I've certainly found, I think we've all found in these cases is um, often if you're, do, you're when you're in, have an, a neighborhood that has been um, disinvested for, disinvested in for a long time, um, there's very, a very active um, community groups that have been lobbying for a long time for all kinds of improvements, um, some of which will include more green space, um, more trees, uh, you know, cleaning up of certain parks and refurbishing parks. And so these advocates, again, part of the problem that we've been identifying is that, you know, th they may have been asking for these things for 15, uh, 20 years, and when they finally start to get a refurbished park or more green space, it comes along with new condos and, 
and the kinds of things that ca can lead to displacement. But that's been happening now for a while, and so a lot of community advocates have been developing strategies to um, avoid this issue or mitigate it. So does anybody have um, any kind of best practices or? Um, so I'm from the Bronx, the only one in the city who's from the mainland, right? You know, so flood <laughs> flooding's a little different for us up there because we've got an escape plan. Y'all are gonna <laughs> drown. No, kidding. This, this right here behind me, this $250 uh, million investment is gonna help out a lot. Um, but, you know, I think when we look at best practices, we have to take a step back and realize that best practices, we talk about them in broad strokes, um, but they really have to be customized for communities. In the Bronx, by and large, it's the, you know, every real estate journal calls it the next hot spot, right? It's, it's the only place where you can do affordable real estate development. And as a result of that buzz, and in the South Bronx particularly, that buzz happens about every five to seven years as a cycle, and it becomes the it neighborhood. And then we have good people like Brookfield, good people, um, who invest a billion dollars to build a, you know, 30, uh, 2,500 units of housing, you know, but what does the community do? And oftentimes we hear, well, rising tides raise all boats, right? That's funny, you don't get the pun. Yes, we're happy, we're good. <laughs> the challenge is that some of those boats have holes in them, structural holes that have been caused by structural racism. Um, becoming environmentally, environmental dumping grounds in many respects. So when we say rising tides raise all boats, we really have to take a look at the, the, the nuances of each communities and develop a customized plan and approach for those communities. And I'll use the South Bronx as an example because we are a bed of activism. Uh, and I've been on both sides of it. I've been the activist and I've also been the person who had a pinata made of me and had it beat in front of my office. So, so I, can, I can offer both extremes. I think in the Bronx, we've done a fairly adequate job of slowing gentrification down. Um, not stopping gentrification, but slowing it down in so much that we're allowing government to catch up and create innovative tools to assist us in that slowdown. And how do we do that? We engage authentically. Um, we, instead of, you know, the comment was made during one of the plenary sessions of it, calling people downtown to City Hall for a community meeting. That doesn't work. Uh, we flipped a script. We do things called kitchen table talks. We find a family in NYCHA and they host us in their home. We, brought, we buy dinner, they bring the community in. Um, we do an insane amount of bilingual, uh, uh, trilingual, we're just very language conscious when it comes to survey work. Um, and making sure that we're investing those dollars appropriately. You know, we have a lot of different plans, and I see Elijah here from the city, and I've known Elijah. We actually met years ago at a waterfront co conference. Um, but we flip the script when it comes to city investment, because oftentimes it's, here's the plan, here's how much money you have, here's how you're going to spend it, pushing back to the city and saying, you know what, out of a $145 million plan to reimagine Hunts Point, you only allocated $35,000 for community engagement. Is that an issue? Yes, that's an issue. And you push back on it, and it becomes more of a negotiation because in historically white neighborhoods, white folks show up with attorneys. White folks show up with lobbyists like me to get things done. In disenfranchised neighborhoods, usually neighborhoods of color, they don't have those systems and structures. They can't afford a $1,300 an hour bill. So we have to start educating ourselves on how to move forward in ways that Quite frankly, the folks who can get a billion dollars worth of investment and a fast track plan for resiliency do. We need to adopt those uptown, right? I, early in my career, I used to live in a rectory. There was an old priest who said, you know, Mr. Brady, if you want to work downtown, you got to talk downtown. We've got to start talking downtown and building those systems and structures in with our community activist groups to demand equality and equity, and not be intimidated by a team of city attorneys or very smart people who know a lot more about resiliency than I do, um, to ask for equity in services, equity in timeline, and priorities. Right. Does anybody have anything to add? 
I think as we think about these projects and funding the projects, um, a new approach is using a triple bottom line approach. So really looking at the cost of the project, the benefits, but expanding that to social and environmental benefits as well, or uh, disbenefits. Um, and I think that's a really important tool that still um, is, is getting a lot of research. We just completed um, some work with the Water Research Foundation on this topic. And I think what's really lacking in those types of analyses are really who is benefiting and really identifying who is the community, who is benefiting from these um, types of projects, and, and really taking a step back and adding that social equity component to it. Um, working with the community, as you've said, um, really understanding what their specific needs are and making sure that we address that as part of a project. Um, one example that I have is a project in New Orleans we were working on to reduce flood risk. Um, big, big flood project, luckily it was funded by HUD, which is a little bit more open-minded in terms of funding and what the funding can be used for. Um, they allowed a triple bottom line approach justification. Um, so we were able to justify lots of trees, bike lanes, things like that. Um, but what the community said was, you know, great, get the water off the streets, but what we could really use is a community center where we have solar panels to charge our cell phones after a storm event. So just thinking about um, having those engagements with the community and really getting these unique ideas, that was, it was a low cost um, addition to the project, but something that really meant a lot to that specific community. Um, so, as you said, really just making sure that you're on the ground and talking to the people um, that are going to be receiving the benefits. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, so are there cer certain types of um, climate resilience infrastructure that are, that you see tend to be, I guess, more or less um, better or worse for in terms of environmental gentrification? I think I was gonna take the lead on this one again. Um, so I think there's a lot of factors to think about um, in terms of risk for gentrification. Um, location is obviously a big one here. Um, most of the climate resiliency projects are geared toward these communities. Um, so we really need to start thinking about um, how we can be careful with our investments. Obviously the scale and scope of the project, so maybe a one-off park might not be as big of a risk as like a long linear project um, that's gonna impact a big community. Um, and then thinking about uh, what practices and policies are in place. So thinking about the community, um, have they been engaged? Are there policies in place to make sure that there's affordable housing, um, that there's tenant protections and rent controls, things like that. Um, so really thinking about projects more holistically um, in terms of uh, remediating that risk. I, th I, I think that, that, that that's important. You're pointing out at something that I, I wanted to bring up, which is like sort of diversity of the offering, right? So like developing a park uh, in a neighborhood that you know may see uh, more or newer development or redevelopment after that. Like, you know, if, if there are policies in place that that ensure that, you know, there's affordability, mm -hmm. affordable housing, that there's a variety of of uses that actually serve the community um, is important. Um, it, you know, I just recently uh, uh, worked, I w I've been working on uh, Bronx Point, like you mentioned, um, uh, Melissa, and um, you know, this is a 100% uh, affordable building uh, right within a park, right? So we were able to, to, to through community engagement um, and a lot of discussions with the community, um, give this neighborhood in the Bronx, um, you know, the opportunity to have, you know, a building that has over 400 units of affordable housing, uh, plus another, another phase that will come up, uh, and, and at the same time extend uh, uh, an existing park asset that was there and create better connections from the neighborhood to the waterfront in this case, and and provide the amenities that they actually needed. So as part of that, you know, at the, at the beginning of the project, you know, I think a couple of things happened. One, the developer team that was selected, um, LNM at Taipei, um, worked with the city, uh, identifying early on key 
community stakeholders that will be partners in the development. So like organizations like Bronx Works were part of it. Um, the, the Universal Hip Hop Museum that's gonna come up there was, was a part of this development. So there was, a, there was a, a, an effort from the beginning to say, okay, this is 100% affordable, this is for the people of the Bronx, and what are the things that, that, that we can bring together with us uh, in the development to make sure that they have the things that they need. And then uh, on the other side, it was like a very thorough community engagement process. And I, in, in a way, I actually learned a lot from that. Um, it was pushed by, um, by the co-developer type A uh, that they wanted to, to, to really talk to everyone. And so key has been, in, in, in com my community engagement process or the, the process that we have followed after in other projects, key is that we meet people at where they are um, workshops, community workshops are not the only way in which you can engage people. So uh, developing, uh, you know, surveys that are online or on paper, uh, showing up at the park or at, the, uh, or, or at a community uh, um, um, a key uh, spot in the, in the neighborhood, like a supermarket or a church, setting up a table and talking to people that walk by. Um, it, you know, uh, it, it, there's uh, doing a site walkthrough uh, with key stakeholders, like going to schools and going to um, to um, to uh, senior housing is important because all these people are going to be using the space. All these people have needs that we don't know, and um, if we don't talk to them, then we don't. We're not really offering at the end a design that's integrated that really uh, fills the needs of the community. And you know. It, I, 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 very simple, but uh, one key feature of that Bronx Point Park is the playground, huge playground. And it's huge because the community needed one that was that big, that was no playground around and, and kids had nothing to do. And it became the main fe feature of the, of the project and that came directly from the community. I, I have a follow-up question to that. Um, how, what was the funding structure for that project? <laughs> I mean, I don't have all the details because I'm just a landscape architect in the project. <laughs> she, she was expensive. Um, and she's, she's not done yet. It, yeah. Was it a public uh, private? Just, just the taking for the Mill Pond Park extension. Uh, it used to be a former bus depot uh, owned by Pantheon Properties. Full disclosure, they were a client one time. Um, the taking alone uh, was very expensive. Um, so you know, taking a look at the scope of the entire project and the fact that now it's being phased in over time. And just, I think there are just certain um, contractions within the market. Um, interest rates are crazy. Things are getting more and more expensive. Workforce is just bananas. Any pro forma that you developed two years ago is good luck. <laughs> Maybe two minutes ago, you're, in safe, you're <laughs> safe. Um, but I think Bronx Point, um, it's a beautiful project. It's a community needed project. It's in the middle of a really uh, intricate transportation hub. There's not a lot of green space. Um, it's, the community benefits will definitely outweigh the cost over time, but we have to be very real about the conversations of who's paying for this, yeah. right? And in public and private partnerships, oftentimes the public side, they do come with money, right, over time, but it's the private side that really has to pony up the cash my experience with funding is really that those public-private partnerships are the key to getting the community benefits. So um, most of the projects that are happening, environmental um, climate resiliency projects, are a result of maybe capital improvement plans, so being paid right from the municipality, or a function of some type of um, FEMA or HUD funding. Um, where you really need to start thinking about what is the benefit, what is the driver for that grant, how do you kind of tailor the project to meet that. Um, so my experience really has been that partnering with those, uh, maybe like the Trust for Public Land with the municipality, something like that, where you can really talk to um, kind of merging uh, the requirements. So maybe one is stormwater management, whereas Trust for Public Land is really, has a strong desire to build a lot of parks. Um, that's where you can really get the win-win or partnering with a, um, an agency that's really looking at building affordable housing um, and, and combining that with a stormwater management park. Um, those, I think, are really where you see a lot of the community benefits come through. Right, and I would just say, you know, on the community side, you know, we talk about the community process, right? The 
thing that I think we need to remember is that the process should not end when the construction stops and you're leased up. The process has to continue. You know, earlier today we talked about maintenance and parks and things like that. People will build you a beautiful park, but then in 10 years, who's paying for the maintenance of it? Mm -hmm. So when we think about these community agreements, benefits agreements, or agreements with the city, making sure that when we've planned out this project, we're planning for the entire cost, and that we constantly revisit that community uh, visioning sessions or community check-ins to make sure that we're still staying the course and we're going in the right direction, but also building gover governance and authority structures to call people out when they're not upholding their side of the bargain. I think that maybe uh, I, I, I agree. It's super important that, that there's continuity and that and that community engagement or stakeholder engagement extends beyond just the beginning of the project. Um, and and you know establishing diversity is important at the beginning. Continuity is important at the end. So you know it's um, it's it, it's key that that those things are in place. That it's not just like you know you come once and then and then you leave. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And I guess we only have about five more minutes for um, the panel. So I, does anybody have any um, other kinds of examples where they think that things have been done in a way, you know, uh, innovative models or different land trusts, or any kind of thing that's sort of a little bit outside the box that seemed to really, or seems promising for mitigating against gentrification. Sometimes you don't know till 10 years down the road. But. I think really investing in the community, so thinking about workforce initiatives and building that into your funding, um, training the community to take over the maintenance of these green jobs or these green practices that we're building. Um, I've also seen many grants, Philadelphia does that, Philadelphia Water Department, um, where they give small grants um, to community members to really keep an eye on their stormwater management system. So I think it's more kind of trash collection and hey, give us a call if you see something major happening. But I think really um, branching out to the community and making sure that we are building sustainable practices, I, I think that's a good um, good one for me. I mean, education is an important part mm -hmm. of, of it. And, 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 and maybe to add to the point that about the community engagement to community engagement is about education primarily, right? It's, it's about listening and, educa and, and education um, more, than, more than like, you know, uh, literally giving the, the community the pen to draw. Like, it's actually like sitting down, listening to the stories, and, 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 and when you come back, you, uh, this was a learning experience, right? So you, you sit with them, you, you talk about the issues, you talk about what it takes to uh, maintain a space like that. Why is it important, right? And it, it, sometimes it's, you know, that, that's, that simple step is, is missing, you know, and people, um, you know, are not given the information that they need to actually like appreciate and take ownership of, of uh, and, and be, become the stewards for, for, for this, this type of spaces. Yeah, I would say, you know, education is huge. Workforce is huge. Um, ongoing capacity building, even more important. Um, particularly when it comes to community land trusts. Um, I'm a big fan of it, but I'm also very scared about it. Um, because I saw what happened with affordable housing when we went through a sim similar model. If we don't invest now with building the appropriate capacity, building, and this is logistical capacity, nothing about their mission, but you know, do you understand how to read a pro forma? Can you look at a 15-year refi? You know, while those may not be readily you know, uh, relatable to green infrastructure, they really are. You know, do you have the money to take care of a park? Parks are expensive. They're expensive to build, but do you have money for that? You know, my, my mother used to say, do you have McDonald's money? You know, um, do we? And we, it's, I think, incumbent upon us and incumbent upon, you know, the city and, and municipal structures and the federal government, if we're really going to seriously invest in community land trust, which I think is a really good tool, a uh, really good tool, we have to ensure that we're building the capacity and the understanding through education we're providing the means to workforce development, but we're also providing continuity. You know, one of the best ways to prevent gentrification is to stay. However you can stay, to stay. Yeah, thank you, and I just would add to that too, a more kind of general point of strengthening the overall mechanisms for affordable housing in the city and making sure that, you know, those things instead are, are being strengthened rather than reduced. 
um, yeah, so that people can stay in place. And uh, I think we can open it up now for questions or comments. Yeah, Can go ahead. The mic? Oh, oh <laughs> sorry. The mic is coming to you. Oh, oh. 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 okay. <laughs> go ahead. Do you have recommendations for what, you know, those of us in the room who have the skill set to talk to government agencies can do to help raise voices? So, for example, with the Army Corps HATS plan, there were a lot of low-income environmental justice communities that were explicitly left out because of the way they evaluate the cost of things. And I know that most of the parks groups we were working with were including that in their feedback, but it's very difficult to get an entity like the Army Corps to have practices that really do speak to a community that is going to have uh, difficulty responding in the ways in which they can really take feedback. So do you have strategies to use for groups that are trying to raise up the communities around them that don't have the existing skill sets to respond to these very, very formal um, processes that have really big impacts on their community? Yes, um, I think step one is they've got to show up and show up all the time, right? And there has to be a level of accountability, right? Earlier today, we were talking to the commissioner and she was like, God, there was this one guy who showed up everywhere and he was just in my ear, but that guy, thank God, his name is Michael too, um, got on her board and affected change, right? You know, so being the squeaky wheel, lobbyists are nothing more than the squeaky wheel, right? They're the person who's always in somebody's ear. So with the Army Corps of Engineers, it's being the squeaky wheel, finding that congressman, calling Richie Torres, who's our, our congressman in the Bronx, and saying, we have an issue here. Can you bring this up in committee and see how we can go about having these processes changed? And, it's not, and, and that's a long-term game in the short term. It's also about finding other opportunities. Um, one of the, I've had a really good time with it. You know, when government doesn't produce, I go to the private sector and I say, hey, the city gave me a $100,000 grant to do community visioning. That's not nearly enough. And private sector understands what enough is. You know, so they'll match it. They'll give you two to one. Um, and then you can really be empowered to do authentic community engagement. I, I would like to add to that, too, that um, you know, for such a large city, the kind of world of environmental justice activism is very small, and so networking um, and the more people kind of know who you're, that there's a lot of neighborhoods in New York City where people don't realize that there are community organizations that are organizing. They may not call themselves an environmental justice organization, but they're organizing for environmental justice all the same. So they may not be the people that often get called upon to take part in these kinds of community engaged projects. But if you know any of the groups like they're you know they try to include people when they can so if you know any of the kind of usual the people who usually show up and are part of things and just make sure that they know who you are and that you want to be at the table i think it's a pretty usually a pretty inclusive group and I, um, yeah. I wanted to add to you know and i'm maybe biased because i'm the, i don't know the designer in the, in the table or like you know it's but having a if you're able as an organization as a neighborhood community group uh, you have an idea and ha being able to uh, get a quick like sort of visualization of what the project is or like a, a little plan, a vision plan or a ma master plan. The, if, if, if you are able, if that community is able to, to secure a little bit of fun to actually just like, you know, create, have a, that vision, have clarity on, 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 you know, what is it that you're trying to do and, and have someone like any, anyone in this table sort of help you visualize it, that's, the, that's what you're gonna take to the city. That's what you're gonna take to private investors. That's what you're gonna take to, you're gonna talk with the community with that. So that's how you sort of, you know, that's a way of, for you to actually create um, movement and, and traction behind uh, these important issues that, you know, sometimes are hard to understand for even for the community itself, and you have to sell that idea to, you know, so that it makes the list, uh, the top of the list of like I don't know city agencies or 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 or, or a private developer that wants a you know um, combined project with a public public private partnership project. And don't forget the banks. 
sorry, don't forget the banks. Um, banks have like four revenue streams. You can tap into all four. So if you, if, you, if you don't have the capacity to go with the Army Corps of Engineer, make best friends with your branch manager at Bank of America, and then do some networking because you can pull on four different streams per bank and, and really build out your war chest to get things done. Well, I've actually seen that happen. <laughs> um, okay, this person right here. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you all for your time uh, and providing all your, your uh, insights. Um, quick question for you all. You all spent a, a decent amount of the time talking about um, how to, I guess, slow the impacts of environmental gentrification. I'm curious um, how to work within environmental stewardship in a community where environmental gentrification has already happened. Um, I live in Brooklyn, born and raised. Um, I'm in Williamsburg, and I've been volunteering uh, on a project to redevelop a park nearby, and I would love for the benefits to impact the new and longtime residents of the neighborhood, but I fear what the redevelopment of that park might do to some of those old timers, those people who have been living in the neighborhood for gentrification who have already been, some, some who have already been displaced after the redevelopment of other areas. Um, are you familiar with El Puente? Yes. Okay, so I mean, they, they, that's, you know, the kind of stuff that exactly is what they are doing is um, working for old and new residents and, um, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm sort of going back to this networking thing of trying to, you know, get as many people involved as possible. Um, do you have any other suggestions? I think getting as many people involved in expanding your network, it's great when you walk into a room and everyone gives you credibility. Um, there's a, a group in the Bronx, for example. First of all, congratulations on being able to afford Williamsburg. So uh, <laughs> if you need a check to do community engagement, he's got it. No. Um, <laughs> You know, there's a project, uh, Cap the Cross Bronx. I'm sure many of us have, have heard it. Um, it gives me great joy, but I am also scared as hell about it um, because of real estate speculation, but it also has some great potential for, for the Bronx. Um, and the loving the Bronx is taking the lead, the community lead on it. And N Nilka Martell is just an amazing bubble of joy and energy who, who I really love very much. But Nilka has really expanded her network dramatically to where, whether she walks into City Hall, whether she walks into DEP, whomever, they know who she is and they know why she's there. So making sure that you build that community recognition because then you are the credible messenger for negotiation. And making sure, if in you know, the case of a park redevelopment, take a look at where are the closest NYCHA sites? Where are the closest homeless shelters? Where are the closest uh, harm reduction centers? and engage those populations who are ordinarily not engaged. If you think that someone is marginalized or vulnerable, get them in your tent. If they are not in your tent, they will become the biggest headache that you will ever have in the world, not because they're going to protest you, but because you've never introduced them to the project, you never built their internal capacity in terms of how that project can better their lives. So make sure you put as many people in your tent as possible. The tent can always get bigger. Yes, Paul. Oh. Okay, and this is gonna be the last. The last one, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so uh, as a former regulator, I was very interested to hear Michael talk about accountability and governance building that in so that you don't get a promise that doesn't actually come true. I'm wondering, are there any actual models of that that you're proud to have been involved in, or is it aspirational? So that I, there are models that exist. The Battery Park City Authority, right? You know, that uh, Jacob Javits Center. They're public-private partnerships that are, have the authority of the state to do activities. Um, have we seen one that was appropriately created in a very localized way? I don't think we've seen it yet. Um, I think we can see it. We have the, the foundational effects, you know, for example, conservancy models. Um, however, uh, you, with a conservancy, you have the governance structure, but you don't have the authority. And I think it would behoove the state and our municipal partners to really put their money and their authority where their mouths are, 
when it comes to creating governance structures that actually have authority. You know, we try with community boards to say, oh, there's local authority. There's no local authority in the community board. They're purely advisory at the bequest of the borough presidents and a couple council members. Um, but to actually give local communities structures and governance models and have authority over their future is enormously important. Uh, but it's a work in progress. But there's a, lot, there's a lot of best practices to pull from, I think. Um, do we have time for one, one more? I don't think so. No? Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Hopefully we can chat um, for the next 10 minutes before the next or closing. Okay, round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. I'm sorry to cut it off. I know this is a huge group, but we do have our next and final session starting at four downstairs in the main hall. Um, thanks, everyone. <laughs>